Hello, Mr. Gasta here. As many of you may know, uh, I'm a big uh, video guy. I've been using videos for teaching for many years now for a lot of different purposes. And uh, just a few months ago, in a conversation with Mr. Miller, I got this idea to utilize the um, auto-translate feature that exists in YouTube. And uh, I realized it could potentially really help ELL students uh, because it does convert it into a variety of different languages. This is where I need your help. It's very hard for me to test if the translations are good. Not being a fluent speaker of any foreign languages, I, I'm kind of in the dark. So you really help me with this. Um, and the way you're going to do it is I'm going to put a video together that has um, subtitle translations in Spanish on the screen. And I ask that you go through. I'm going to print up um, a sheet probably to fill out. But if you don't have a sheet, you can just number it and label it with the videos. Um, and I believe it's going to be like like uh, example A, example B, example C. You can just do it on a piece of paper. Um, and what I ask you to do is to write the uh, the real number I'm after is the percentage correct that that translation equals the English that's being spoken in the video. And it's really the goal here. It's not really sort of 100% perfect gram grammatically correct. It's more, will this get the point across to ELL students who don't really understand English? That's really what we're after. So 100% is like totally perfect. Um, and try to do that percentage uh, for each one in your own opinion. Um, so one thing you can do also, and I, I think some people have found this to be helpful, is you either pause it as you go, that may really help because the words can go quite, quite quickly at the bottom, or you could slow it down, there's a slow down feature. If you go on YouTube on any video, there's a little gear at the bottom. If you click on that, uh, there is the ability to slow it down. I think you can choose a 0.75 speed, so 75% as fast, and there's half speed, and then uh, you can't go any less than that. The 0.25 is you're not gonna hear the words. So if you can do this for me as a favor, um, maybe this will be a good step moving forward for something that could uh, help ELL students, not just in Ichabod Crane, but at many schools, who knows how far this can go. So uh, thank you in advance for your help. If you have any questions, definitely come see me. Thanks. Hello, Mr. Gasser here. Welcome to Mapping Review. Know it, stream flow direction. When a stream crosses contour lines, the contour lines are V-shaped. The V's point uphill. The stream flows opposite the direction in which the V's point. So here we see the stream is flowing this direction. And notice the contour lines make V's that point the opposite way. Number one, draw an arrow on the stream showing stream flow direction. The V's made by the contour lines point this way, so the stream flows this direction. Number two, draw an arrow to indicate the direction of stream flow for hammer stream. The V's point this way, so the stream flows this direction. Know it. Earth rotates as shown by the arrow. This causes the east local times to be ahead of the local times to the west. Earth rotates this direction, so the eastern part of the country is ahead of the west coast. Everybody here, Mr. Mahan with another SLJ Living Environment review video. Remember, to keep up on these videos, I'm glad you're here. They're going to help us day by day prepare for that Regents. All right, anyways, here we go. It's chapter four, and we are overviewing of cells. What's in them? How do they get fed? And by that, I mean, how do they like get the nutrients they need to survive? So, if you remember from last night's video, you guys, all living things, all organisms are made up of cells. Everyone is Every human has over a trillion cells in his or her body, which is totally amazing and totally incredible. What's not so incredible is how cells look underneath the microscope. Pretty boring. Just look like a bunch of little squiggles. 
That's because everything inside a cell is super, super tiny. And we learned that to get a better picture of what's in a cell, you probably need to use either like a really super multi-million dollar microscope or you need to draw an illustration of what's inside it to make it workable. That doesn't mean to see, say you can't see anything using a regular microscope. So if you use a microscope from SLJ, you could, and you were looking at a plant, you could probably get a picture of something like this. So on the outside of the cell, you have the cell membrane. Okay, here we are. Uh, we're about to go on a family vacation. Our bags are all packed. We're going to get on a plane and fly to Seattle in just a, just a little bit. And uh, I'm showing what I want to show you is this. I take out my bag here. I'm going to show you deodorant. Very exciting, I know. Deodorant is super exciting. Um, and what this is, this is like a um, gel type deodorant. In the video where we introduced the atom, I went off a bit about how the at the center of an atom we have the nucleus, and that's actually a very small fraction of the total volume of the atom. And the electron, even though we call it a particle, it can really be best described as kind of a, a schmear around this nucleus. That although it's a particle, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we can never tell exactly at a given moment where the particle is and what its momentum is. So to describe it as a particle is a little bit, I don't know, at, at best, it's a little bit strange. And we said that the, the way that they describe it, they don't say that this particle is in an orbit, like, you know, the, the planets around the sun, an orbit would be like, you know, like that. That would be like the orbit of Halley's Comet around the sun. Instead, it can be described as a probability function around the nucleus. So if you know if the nucleus is there, we have one or You've probably noticed that we've been talking an awful lot about fractions around here lately. Well, now I'm going to tell you something you can do with fractions that's really easy. No, no, not juggling fractions. Although that is pretty easy for me. I'm talking about something even easier than that. I'm talking about multiplying fractions. Multiplying fractions is super easy. In fact, it's easier than adding fractions, and that's why we're going to learn it first. The reason it's easier is because fractions are really just division problems, and multiplication and division get along much better than addition and division. Now, since fractions are division, that means if I have the problem 1 fourth times 2 thirds, it's the same as the problem 1 divided by 4 times 2 divided by 3. That means I have both multiplication. Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about simple machines. A simple machine is a device that makes work easier by magnifying or changing the direction of a force. That means that simple machines allow someone to do the same work with less effort. Simple machines have been known since prehistoric times and were used to help build the amazing structures left behind by ancient cultures. The Greek philosopher Archimedes identified three simple machines more than 2,000 years ago. The lever, the pulley, and the screw. He discovered that a lever would create a mechanical advantage, which means that using a lever would allow a person to move something that would normally be too heavy for them to shift. Archimedes said that with a long enough lever and a place to rest it, a person could move the world. Over the next few centuries, more simple machines were recognized, but it was less than 450 Hello, Mr. Gazda here, and yes, my silhouette does look really weird on the screen, but today we're going to do waterfall formation, how a waterfall forms. So, check it out. Let's say we start here with a, with a bit of a hill. These are uh, three different layers of bedrock, green, purple, red is what I'm using to show them. And um, let's say you now add a river in there. So you have a river flowing over this flat area and then flowing downhill here. Now, let's think about what's happening in the river itself. You have 
uh, pebbles and rocks, rocks the size of my fist or maybe even bigger. They were kind of rolling and skidding along the bottom. They're, they're rubbing against the bedrock itself, causing abrasion, and that's going to be a type of erosion. Uh, you have sand moving along the river, also will be scratching and wearing away, eroding this bedrock. So give it some time, erosion will occur, and it will look like this. So a lot, some you can see some has been eroded. The one key thing that I need to point out for a waterfall to form, this particular condition must exist, and it is the top layer of rock must be more resistant to erosion than the bottom layers. So this will erode slower, and these will erode faster. That will lead to uh, a waterfall, as we're going to see. So give us some more time and more erosion. Uh, this will happen. More time passes, and now you have what you think of a traditional waterfall here. You'll have a pool of water down here with all the force of the water. Uh, though it will swirl around, the rocks in there, and sand will really kind of bounce back here, rub up against it, cause more uh, uh, erosion down there. And then you have this. See a little bit of an overhang is forming? Now there's more of an overhang. Obviously, at some point, this can't just keep sticking out. It will uh, stick out too much and break off, and it will look like this. That happens, a huge chunk of rock uh, will be at the base of the waterfall here. We still have that swirling of rock here, eroding these uh, layers there. Then you have that, another overhang. That layer breaks off. And then this will continue as we see here. And you may notice that the waterfall is moving this way. It's retreating, it's re retreating upstream. And uh, that's what waterfalls do. So I'm going to play this in uh, a bit more sped up to get a good uh, sense of the animation.